Is it rational to believe in God? Many people think that faith and reason are opposites, that belief in God and tough-minded logical reasoning are like oil and water. They are wrong. Belief in God is far more rational than atheism. Logic can show that there is a God. If you look at the universe with common sense and an open mind, you'll find that it's full of God's fingerprints. A good place to start is with an argument by Thomas Aquinas, the great 13th century philosopher and theologian. The argument starts with the not very startling observation that things move, but nothing moves for no reason. Something must cause that movement, and whatever caused that must be caused by something else, and so on. But this causal chain cannot go backwards forever. It must have a beginning. There must be an unmoved mover to begin all the motion in the universe, a first domino to start the whole chain moving, since mere matter never moves itself. A modern objection to this argument is that some movements in quantum mechanics, radioactive decay, for example, have no discernible cause. But hang on a second. Just because scientists don't see a cause doesn't mean there isn't one. It just means science hasn't found it yet. Maybe someday they will. But then there will have to be a new cause to explain that one, and so on and so on. But science will never find the first cause. That's no knock on science. It simply means that a first cause lies outside the realm of science. Another way to explain this argument is that everything that begins must have a cause. Nothing can come from nothing. So if there's no first cause, there can't be second causes, or anything at all. In other words, if there's no creator, there can't be a universe. But what if the universe were infinitely old, you might ask? Well, all scientists today agree that the universe is not infinitely old, that it had a beginning in the Big Bang. If the universe had a beginning, then it didn't have to exist. And things which don't have to exist must have a cause. There's confirmation of this argument from Big Bang cosmology. We now know that all matter, that is, the whole universe, came into existence some 13.7 billion years ago, and it's been expanding and cooling ever since. No scientist doubts that anymore, even though, before it was scientifically proved, atheists called it creationism in disguise. Now, add to this premise a very logical second premise, the principle of causality, that nothing begins without an adequate cause. And you get the conclusion that since there was a Big Bang, there must be a Big Banger. But is this Big Banger God? Why couldn't it be just another universe? Because Einstein's general theory of relativity says that all time is relative to matter. And since all matter began 13.7 billion years ago, so did all time. So there's no time before the Big Bang. And even if there is time before the Big Bang, even if there is a multiverse, that is, many universes with many Big Bangs, as string theory says is mathematically possible, that too must have a beginning. An absolute beginning is what most people mean by God. Yet some atheists find the existence of an infinite number of other universes more rational than the existence of a creator, Never mind that there is no empirical evidence at all that any of these unknown universes exists, let alone a thousand or a gazillion. The conclusion that God exists doesn't require faith. Atheism requires faith. It takes faith to believe in everything coming from nothing. It takes only reason to believe in everything coming from God. You know, for 27 years, I was an atheist. I thought anyone who believed in a God or gods was, well, stupid or uneducated, naive, gullible, or just into the gig for money, sex, and power. I mean, after all, everyone knows that religion is just a psychological crutch for intellectual weaklings, right? So, what changed my mind? Well, look, I tell the whole story in my book, Shattered, but for our purposes here on Prager University, I was simply challenged by my Christian teammates on the Cincinnati Reds to read some religious books, critique them, and then share with the guys where the authors were wrong and why atheism is the only real and true outlook for anyone not deceived by fantasy fiction or mythology. I mean, 
for someone who wants to base their beliefs and values upon evidence and argument, not emotion and tradition. Now look, simply put, I set out to disprove theism, which I didn't think would take very long. But I ran into some difficulties along the way. <laughs> difficulties like Aristotle, Augustine, Aquinas. I mean, in simple terms, I was confronted with the awareness that there are really four big bangs that have to be accounted for, not just one. I had never really even considered that before. I mean, we're all familiar with the first big bang, right? It's usually the answer given to the question, why is there something rather than nothing? It's the idea that there was nothing, it popped, and boom, there's something. I mean, that time, matter, and space all came into existence and in some great cosmological flash about 16 billion years ago. There was no gradual development, no transitional forms, just a binary flip, a metaphysical, now you don't see it, and now you do. Fine, I want to follow the evidence wherever it leads. However, astrophysicists tell us that this first Big Bang yielded only a handful of fundamental elements, and that it would take billions and billions of years for the nuclear furnaces of trillions of stars to yield the 118 elements in the periodic table. But the first theoretical cosmological Big Bang, well, it only yields matter and energy. It doesn't even begin to address the origin of life. So how do you get life from non-life? How did abiogenesis occur? I mean, the notion that something can come from nothing. Where's the evidence? Well, you're gonna need another something from nothing leap of faith, some kind of biological second Big Bang. For all the mind-blowing advancements we've made in physics, biology, and chemistry in just the past hundred years, we're still no closer to making it happen. We don't have a clue. The closer we look, the wider the chasm. I mean, sure, we've learned a lot about how to manipulate life forms, how to add and subtract DNA material, even map the human genome, but we have no idea how to literally create life from dead stuff. Now look, at this point, we still only have physics, chemistry, and some basic biology, or matter, energy, and simple life, if you will. But we still don't have a way to account for the great diversity of life forms. I mean, the huge differences between bacteria, plants, and animals. Nor do we have a way to account for the differences between man and animal. We still don't have an anthropology at this point. So we're going to need a kind of anthropological third Big Bang to account for all this which of course is what Darwin was after in his Descent of Man thesis. Now look, Darwin answered a lot of questions, but he could never answer the core question. How did evolution begin? But hey, we're still not done describing the world that is all around us. A final Big Bang is gonna be required to explain how can become a self-reflective human mind. Even the lowest life forms have brains and central nervous systems. I mean, how does something like that become the mind of a Michelangelo, a Shakespeare, a Beethoven? Come on, animals don't do art and they don't appreciate beauty. But the problem is even more basic than that. How do you account for free will and introspection, let alone man's pressing existential drive to ask why? Well, we're going to need some kind of psychological fourth Big Bang to account for man's moral and aesthetic sense. I mean, his, his search for meaning, significance, and purpose. And, of course, his appreciation for the true, the good, and the beautiful. And again, you must understand these problems require bangs. I mean, sudden binary pops into existence since there's no evidence for any gradual development in any of these. So I, like you, have a choice. It's either faith in these four big bangs of somethings from nothings to account for what we see all around us, or faith in some kind of creator God behind it all. So, next time someone asks you, hey, what about the big bang? Make sure you ask them which one, the cosmological, biological, anthropological, or psychological. In 1966, Time magazine ran a cover story asking, Is God Dead? The cover reflected the fact that many people had accepted the cultural narrative that God is obsolete, that as science progresses, there's less need for a God to explain the universe. It turns out, though, 
that the rumors of God's death were premature. In fact, perhaps the best arguments for his existence come from, of all places, science itself. Here's the story. The same year Time featured its now famous headline, the astronomer Carl Sagan announced that there were two necessary criteria for a planet to support life, the right kind of star and a planet the right distance from that star. Given the roughly octillion planets in the universe, that's one followed by 24 zeros, there should have been about septillion planets, that's one followed by 21 zeros, capable of supporting life. With such spectacular odds, scientists were optimistic that the search for extraterrestrial intelligence, known by its initials SETI, an ambitious project launched in the 1960s, was sure to turn up something soon. With a vast radio telescopic network, scientists listened for signals that resembled coded intelligence. But as the years passed, the silence from the universe was deafening. As of 2014, researchers have discovered precisely bubkis, not a zilch, which is to say zero followed by an infinite number of zeros. What happened? As our knowledge of the universe increased, it became clear that there were, in fact, far more factors necessary for life, let alone intelligent life, than Sagan supposed. His two parameters grew to 10, then 20, and then 50, which meant that the number of potentially life-supporting planets decreased accordingly. The number dropped to a few thousand planets and kept on plummeting. Even SETI proponents acknowledged the problem. Peter Schenkel wrote in a 2006 piece for Skeptical Inquirer, a magazine that strongly affirms atheism, in light of new findings and insights, we should quietly admit that the early estimates may no longer be tenable. Today, there are more than 200 known parameters necessary for a planet to support life, every single one of which must be perfectly met or the whole thing falls apart. For example, without a massive, gravity-rich planet like Jupiter nearby to draw away asteroids, Earth would be more like an interstellar dartboard than the verdant orb that it is. Simply put, the odds against life in the universe are astonishing. Yet, here we are, not only existing, but talking about existing. What can account for it? Can every one of those many parameters have been perfectly met by accident? At what point is it fair to admit that it is science itself that suggests that we cannot be the result of random forces? Doesn't assuming that an intelligence created these perfect conditions in fact require far less faith than believing that a life-sustaining Earth just happened to beat the inconceivable odds? But wait, there's more. The fine-tuning necessary for life to exist on a planet is nothing compared with the fine-tuning required for the universe to exist at all. For example, astrophysicists now know that the values of the four fundamental forces, gravity, the electromagnetic force, and the strong and weak nuclear forces, were determined less than one millionth of a second after the Big Bang. Alter any one of these four values ever so slightly, and the universe as we know it could not exist. For instance, if the ratio between the strong nuclear force and the electromagnetic force had been off by the tiniest fraction of the tiniest inconceivable fraction, then no stars could have formed at all. Multiply that single parameter by all the other necessary conditions, and the odds against the universe existing are so heart-stoppingly astronomical that the notion that it all just happened defies common sense. It would be like tossing a coin and having it come up heads ten quintillion times in a row. I don't think so. Fred Hoyle, the astronomer who coined the term Big Bang, said that his atheism was greatly shaken by these developments. One of the world's most renowned theoretical physicists, Paul Davies, has said that the appearance of design is overwhelming. Even the late Christopher Hitchens, one of atheism's most aggressive proponents, conceded that without question the fine-tuning argument was the most powerful argument of the other side. Oxford University professor of mathematics, Dr. John Lennox, has said, the more we get to know about our universe, the more the hypothesis that there is a creator gains in credibility as the best explanation of why we are here. The greatest miracle of all time 
is the universe. It is the miracle of all miracles, one that inescapably points to something or someone beyond itself. If God exists, then the world didn't just evolve by chance, but by deliberate design. There's an artist behind this incredible work of art, this big and beautiful world. If God exists, we're living in a great story, an epic like the Lord of the Rings, with real heroes and heroic tasks. Ultimately, all the twists and turns of this epic narrative will be paid off. Everything will make sense. It will even have a happy ending. Not necessarily or even likely in our own lifetime. Even Moses didn't get into the promised land, but over the grand course of time, in an afterlife, which exists as surely as God exists. If God exists, the presence of evil, hard as it is to accept, makes sense. God allows it for a reason, namely to preserve our free will. And God will reconcile all injustices in the end. If there is no God, life is one big crap shoot. If God does exist, morality is a real, objective feature of the world. If there is no God, morality is just the rules we make up for this little game of life that we play. If God exists, love is the nature of an eternal reality. If there is no God, love is just a fleeting feeling, no more than a bunch of chemical and neurological interactions. If God exists, you are of infinite value. He knows you as a parent knows his child. He's accessible to you. If there is no God, each of us is as insignificant as a rock on an unknown planet. If God exists, death is conquered, because if there is a God, there is a reality outside of space and time. If there is no God, there is nothing immortal, and all the good things in life are destroyed forever. You and everyone you love and everything you think matters are all consigned to oblivion. If there is no God, life is pointless. Everything we've done and lived for will ultimately be in vain. Can I prove with an absolute certainty that God exists? I can make the case that overwhelming evidence suggests that he does, but no, I can't prove that he exists with absolute certainty. That's likely part of his plan. God deliberately doesn't give us absolute proof so that we're free to choose or not to choose to believe in him. So which way do you want to go? Be honest, doesn't your heart at least hope that there is a good God? a transcendent validator of love and all the highest human values? Of course it does. Why would anyone not wish that life has some ultimate purpose, that good and evil are real, that there is ultimate justice, that our love for others means something? If you choose to live as if there is a God, even if you're not sure that there is a God, you'll lose nothing and you gain everything. Religious Christians and Jews are happier, live longer, and are more charitable than their less observant or secular fellow citizens. These are not my opinions. These are the findings of a multitude of scientific studies. If you've been an atheist for a while, it may be difficult for you to change your thinking, even if you find some merit in the many rational arguments for God's existence. But you can change your behavior. You can live as if God exists, even if you hold doubts. Why not? As I said, you'll lose nothing and you have everything to gain. This behavioral approach is far from new. The Jews have long had a saying, we will do and we will understand, which acknowledges that action often precedes understanding. So why not begin with an action? Why not pray the prayer of the skeptic? God, if you exist, you must know that I'm not a believer. So, please, God, give me the gift of faith in your time and in your way. I want to believe whatever is true. Amen. If you say that and mean it and give it some time, be prepared because he will not ignore that prayer. Go on, say it. Find a private place and say it. Your Creator is listening. All good people are appalled by the sufferings of the innocent. When an innocent person is struck by a painful disease or tortured or murdered, we naturally feel sadness and helplessness and often rage. 
Many people have claimed that such suffering is a proof that God does not exist. Their argument goes like this. God is all good and all powerful. Such a God would not permit unnecessary suffering. Yet we constantly observe unjust suffering. Therefore, at least one of the premises about God must be false. Either God is not all good, or he is not all powerful, or he just doesn't exist. What's wrong with this argument? First, let's examine what we mean when we say that God would not permit unjust suffering. There are two categories of suffering. Suffering caused by human beings, which we call moral evils, and suffering caused by nature, for instance, earthquakes or cancer. Free will explains how God could be good and allow moral evil. Because God has given people free will, they are free to behave against God's will. The fact that they do evil does not prove that God is not good. In addition, if there were no God, there would be no absolute standard of good. Every judgment presupposes a standard. And then that's true of our moral judgments too. What is our standard for judging evil to be evil? The most we could say about evil, if there were no God, was that we, in our subjective tastes, didn't like it when people did certain things to other people. We wouldn't have a basis for saying an act was bad, only that we didn't like it. So, the problem of human evil exists only if God exists. As for natural suffering, that poses what appears to be a more difficult question. We see an innocent child suffer, say, from an incurable disease. We complain. Understandable. We don't like it. Understandable. We feel it is wrong, unfair, and shouldn't happen understandable, but illogical unless you believe in God. For if you do not believe in God, your subjective feelings are the only basis upon which you can object to natural suffering. Okay, you don't like it, but how is your not liking something evidence for God not existing? Think about it. It's just the opposite. Our judgments of good and evil, natural as well as human, presuppose God as the standard. If there's no God, there's neither good nor evil. There's just nature, doing what it does. If nature is all there is, there is absolutely no need to explain why one person suffers and another doesn't. Unjust suffering is a problem only because we have a sense of what is just and unjust. But where does this sense come from? Certainly not from nature. There's nothing just about nature. Nature is only about survival. What, in other words, does it mean for suffering to be unnecessary or wrong? How is that determined? Against what standard? Your private standard means nothing. My private standard means nothing. We can talk meaningfully about suffering being unnecessary or wrong only if we have an underlying belief that a standard of right and wrong objectively exists. And if that standard really exists, that means there is a God. Moreover, the believer in God has an incomparably easier time than the atheist psychologically, as well as logically, in dealing with the problem of natural suffering. If you accept that a good God exists, it is possible to also believe that this God somehow sets things right, if not in this world, then in the next. For the atheist, on the other hand, no suffering is ever set right. There is no ultimate justice. The bad win and the good suffer. Earthquakes and cancers kill. End of story. Literally. If nature is all there is, how can a sensitive person remain sane in a world in which tsunamis wipe out whole towns, evil men torture and murder innocent victims, and disease attacks people indiscriminately? The answer is, it's not possible. Is that how you want to live? Is there an afterlife? Life after this life ends? There probably isn't a human being who hasn't asked this question at one time or another. And here's the answer. If there is a God, there is an afterlife. It's that simple. And here's why. First, this life is filled with an immeasurable amount of injustice and suffering. The only way there can be some ultimate justice for victims of evil is if there is an afterlife. And the only way comfort is available to those who suffer unjustly from painful disease and premature death to the death of a child, 
as if there is an afterlife. But such an afterlife exists only if there is a good and just God. A good and just God provides a way to compensate for all the unjust suffering in this world. Second, since God is not physical, the physical world is not the only reality. There is also a non-physical reality. And we humans have a part of us which, being non-physical, survives the death of our body. We call it the soul. But if there is no God, this physical life is all there is. So, no God, no soul, no soul, no afterlife. Now, of course, those who doubt God's existence have every reason to doubt an afterlife. But if you believe in a good God, then you have to believe there's an afterlife. If you say you believe in God, but not in an afterlife, the God you believe in is not only not good, that God is cruel. That God made a world filled with unjust suffering and just left it at that. Now, some people who don't believe in an afterlife offer their own version of immortality. I once attended a funeral where the man officiating said, while there is no afterlife, we do live on through our good works, and in the memories of loved ones. That's what a lot of people who reject an afterlife want to believe. But the idea that human beings live on through their good works or through the memories of loved ones, which generally means a person's children or grandchildren, is simply meaningless. If people live on through their good works, then children who die don't live on. The number of good works most children are even capable of is minuscule. As for babies who die, well, babies can't engage in good works at all, so I guess they just don't live on. Anyway, the truth is that bad works usually live on longer than nearly any good works. In fact, if works make us immortal, Hitler, with all the evil he did, is far more immortal than the kindest people on earth. As for living on in the memories of our children, what do we say to those who have no children? Sorry, you don't live on. Moreover, living on in anyone's memory, as beautiful as that is, is not the same as immortality or an afterlife. As Woody Allen put it, I don't want to achieve immortality through my work. I want to achieve it through not dying. If there's no afterlife, we don't live on. Period. Let's be honest enough to acknowledge that. If there's no afterlife, none of us will ever again be with those we most love and who love us. If there's no afterlife, neither anyone murdered nor any murderer will ever receive ultimate justice. If there's no afterlife, this life, for the vast majority of people who ever lived and for those alive now, is a meaningless crapshoot. Finally, people always ask me, so what happens in the afterlife? To which I can only respond, I don't know, but I do know this. My belief in God and the afterlife keeps me sane. The thought that this life is all there is means that torturers get away with the horrors they have engaged in. It means that this life is random and pointless. And it means that I will never again see anyone I love. This would drive me mad. In fact, I don't see how it wouldn't drive anyone mad who cares about suffering and who loves anyone. So is there an afterlife? If there is a God, of course there is. I'm Dennis Prager. Ever since the 18th century and the dawning of the so-called Age of Reason, most of the best educated people in the world have been absolutely certain that reason alone will lead us to goodness and a good world. We don't need a God, we don't need religion, all we need is reason. Evil, we have been told, for almost three centuries doesn't make sense. It's irrational. That's why you'll often hear murderous dictators referred to as madmen and their evil regimes described as products of madmen. In other words, the very opposite of rational men. Stalin was irrational, Pol Pot was a madman, 
Mao's genocidal cultural revolution in which he directed the killing of 50 to 75 million Chinese in peacetime, no less, is routinely called madness, and the Iranian regime's calls for the annihilation of Israel are routinely dismissed as, you guessed it, irrational. Meanwhile, good and moral things are always associated with being reasonable. But this association of reason with good is wishful thinking. Of course, reason might argue for doing good, but it might just as well argue for doing bad. Take a non-murderous example. Is it right or wrong for a student to cheat on a test? It's wrong, of course. But now answer this. Is it rational or irrational to cheat on a test? The answer is not quite as obvious, is it? After all, if you can get away with it, and it might mean the difference between getting into a great school or getting a great job, cheating on a test may well be reasonable. The same logic applies to participating in a shady but lucrative business deal or engaging in a marital infidelity. If you know you can get away with it or simply judge that the benefits of doing something illegal or immoral outweigh the risk of being caught, why not do it? Or answer this, was it rational or irrational for a non-Jew in Nazi-occupied Europe during World War II to risk his or her life to hide a Jew. We all know that this was moral greatness of the highest order. But was it rational? Not really. You can't get much more rational than self-preservation. Moreover, in all the studies I have read of non-Jewish rescuers of Jews during the Holocaust, and I have read many, I have never read of any rescuers who said that they did what they did because it was the reasonable or rational thing to do. Not one. Reason leads to good only when you want it to, just as it leads to bad when you want it to. Reason is just a tool. It is no more intrinsically moral than a knife. A knife can be used to murder or to torture people, but in the hands of a surgeon, it can be used to save lives. If you want to preserve liberty, then it is rational to fight and risk your life on its behalf. And if you want to maintain a fascist or a communist or an Islamist dictatorship, then it's equally rational to risk your life on its behalf. And talking about liberty, it isn't reason that makes people value liberty. Many rational people value security or order or territory or theocracy or many other things much more than they value liberty. Reason can lead people to all kinds of conclusions. For example, asked if he would kill a disabled baby, a distinguished professor of philosophy at Princeton University responded, quote, yes, if that was in the best interests of the baby and of the family as a whole, unquote. Can you offer a purely rational reason why the professor is wrong? The only reason I can offer is a belief that all human beings are created in God's image and are therefore infinitely precious. But the preciousness of all human life is a belief, not an assertion of reason. The Greeks, the founders of Western reason, thought it quite reasonable to leave sickly babies to die of exposure. The baby would just be a burden on the parents and the state. It was faith-based Jerusalem the other parent of Western civilization, not reason-based Athens that taught the world to keep sickly babies alive. So the next time you read of some terrible crime or some terrible regime, please don't dismiss it as irrational or mad. Call it for what it is, evil. There are two important, indeed fundamental, questions you have to answer in life. The first is, is there a God, specifically a moral and judging creator? The second is, are people basically good? Your answer to the second question will shape just about all of your moral, social, and political views, even more than whether you believe in God. That's why a believer and an atheist who have the same views about human nature almost always have the same social and political views. Let me give you some examples. You've probably heard the phrase, 
poverty causes crime. If you believe that people are basically good, you are likely to believe that poverty or bigotry or some other outside force causes people to commit violent crime. That's the only way you can make sense of the fact that some people commit crimes despite their basically good nature. Something drove them to it. But if you don't believe people are basically good, you're far more likely to blame the criminals themselves, not outside forces, for their actions. One more example. In a society where it is believed that people are basically good, parents in society don't devote great efforts toward making good people. After all, if we're born good, why do you have to teach goodness? On the other hand, those who don't believe we are born all that good understand that parents in society have to undertake major efforts to make children into good adults. Okay then, are people basically good? As I will show, given humanity's history, the answer should be obvious. Of course human nature isn't basically good. Now this doesn't mean that people are basically bad. We are born with real potential to do good, but we are not basically good. Take babies. Babies are lovable and innocent, but they're not good. They're entirely self-centered, as they have to be in order to survive. I want mommy, I want milk, I want to be held, I want to be comforted. And if you do not do all these things immediately, I will ruin your life. That's not goodness, that's narcissism. We are born narcissists, preoccupied with number one, ourselves. And if you've ever worked with kids, you know how cruel, how bullying they can be. And don't parents have to tell their child tens of thousands of times, say thank you? Now why is that? If we're naturally good, wouldn't feeling and expressing gratitude come naturally? And then there is the historical record. Evils, huge evils affecting much of the human race have been the norm. Here goes just a few examples. The Ottoman Turks targeted millions of Armenian Christians for death during World War I. The German Nazi regime murdered six million Jews, two out of every three European Jews, including more than a million children and babies. The Soviet communist regime slaughtered about five million Ukrainians and about 25 million other innocents. The Chinese communists killed about 70 million Chinese and enslaved the rest of the Chinese people. The North Korean communist regime has built what one can only call the world's largest concentration camp, most of North Korea. In post-colonial Congo in the decade between 1998 and 2008, over five million people were murdered and tens if not hundreds of thousands of women raped. Of course, before that, about 10 million Africans were kidnapped and made slaves in the European slave trade. And another 10 to 18 million Africans were enslaved by Arab slave traders. And let me ask you this, if people are basically good, why does every civilization have so many laws to control human behavior? Knowing all this, those who believe that people are basically good have simply made a decision to believe that and ignore all the evidence. Why do people commit evil? Because it's easy to, because it's tempting to, and yes, because it often accords with human nature. That is why figuring out how to make good people is the single most important project in all of human life. But first, you have to believe it's necessary. Do you believe that good and evil exist? The answer to this question separates Judeo-Christian values from secular values. Let me offer the clearest possible example, murder. Is murder wrong? Is it evil? Nearly everyone would answer yes, but now I will pose a much harder question how do you know? I'm sure you think murder is wrong, hmm. but how do you know? If I asked you how you know that the Earth is round, you would show me photographs from outer space or offer me measurable data. 
But what photographs could you show? What measurements could you provide that prove that murder or rape or theft is wrong? The fact is, you can't. There are scientific facts, but without God, there are no moral facts. In a secular world, there can only be opinions about morality. They may be personal opinions or society's opinions, but only opinions. Every atheist philosopher I have read or debated on this subject has acknowledged that if there is no God, there is no objective morality. Judeo-Christian values are predicated on the existence of a God of morality. In other words, only if there is a God who says murder is wrong, is murder wrong. Otherwise, all morality is opinion. The entire Western world, what we call Western civilization, is based on this understanding. Now, let me make two things clear. First, this doesn't mean that if you don't believe in God, you can't be a good person. There are plenty of kind and moral individuals who don't believe in God and Judeo-Christian values. But the existence of these good people has nothing, nothing to do with the question of whether good and evil really exist if there is no God. Second, there have been plenty of people who believed in God who were not good people. Indeed, more than a few have been evil and have even committed evil in God's name. The existence of God doesn't ensure people will do good. I wish it did. The existence of God only ensures that good and evil objectively exist and are not merely opinions. Without God, we therefore end up with what is known as moral relativism, meaning that morality is not absolute, but only relative to the individual or to the society. Without God, the words good and evil are just another way of saying, I like and I don't like. If there is no God, the statement murder is evil is the same as the statement, I don't like murder. Now, many will argue that you don't need moral absolutes. People won't murder because they don't want to be murdered. But that argument is just wishful thinking. Hitler, Stalin, and Mao didn't want to be murdered, but that hardly stopped them from murdering about a hundred million people. It is not a coincidence that the rejection of Judeo-Christian values in the Western world by Nazism and Communism led to the murder of all these innocent people. It is also not a coincidence that the first societies in the world to abolish slavery, an institution that existed in every known society in human history, were Western societies rooted in Judeo-Christian values. And so were the first societies to affirm universal human rights, to emancipate women, and to proclaim the value of liberty. Today, the rejection of Judeo-Christian values and moral absolutes has led to a world of moral confusion. In the New York Times in March 2015, a professor of philosophy confirmed this. He wrote, What would you say if you found out that our public schools were teaching children that it is not true that it's wrong to kill people for fun? Would you be surprised? I was. The professor then added, The overwhelming majority of college freshmen view moral claims as mere opinions. So then, whatever you believe about God or religion, here is a fact. Without a God who is the source of morality, morality is just a matter of opinion. So, if you want a good world, the death of Judeo-Christian values should frighten you. In the external or physical world, we're all aware of standard cause and effect, right? You know, object A acts upon object B with force X. We all get that because it applies to just about everything from electrons to athletes. But now consider events in your internal or mental world. What causes your thoughts? Some of our thoughts have external causes, like when we touch something and suddenly realize it's hot. We don't deliberate whether or not to pull our hand away, right? Our brain has already fired the instruction to do so, involuntarily. 
in some strange sense, we didn't really pull our hand away at all because we didn't choose to do it. Our brain did it before consulting us. A second cause of our thoughts is internal. Say you're thinking about giving a big presentation and as you do so, you get increasingly nervous and your blood pressure and your heart rate jump up. Now, nothing external is acting upon you. You're doing all the causing internally, right? Your anxious thoughts are causing your brain to send signals to your heart, and we get that. But now I want you to consider a third category of your thoughts. It's your conscious choices. Something as simple as choosing where to go for lunch. Now, when you introspect, when you think about your thinking, do you believe that you're the active agent in charge of the process or that you're just a passive recipient of the instruction? That you have no choice in the matter. It's all external forces, be they environmental, genetic, chemical, biological, or neurological. In other words, do you think all your thoughts have external causes beyond your control? Or do you think that you control some, if not most, of your thoughts. Now let's stay with our lunch example for a second. Back to the question. I ask you, where do you want to go for lunch today? Now, if all you are is a brain, an exhaustively physical system of neurons and synapses, then there's no you that's going to be making a choice at all. Your thought processes are basically just a complex series of colliding electron dominoes crashing into one another. It's just physical cause and effect, right? Something that can be exhaustively understood in terms of physics and chemistry. There's no you that's an agent that's deliberating or choosing or exercising free will. And that's why if you are just a brain, you cannot have free will. You would just be a physical machine, a very complex but programmed computer. But if you're something more than your brain, if you're the thing that has the brain, then when I ask you, where do you want to go for lunch? You're going to start deliberating. You're going to be weighing your taste preferences, the commute time, perhaps even counting calories. You'd be weighing various reasons to choose one place over another. You wouldn't be caused to think about any of these things. You would choose to think about these things, and you could stop anytime you wanted to. So what we have here therefore are two different types of things, an immaterial mind and the material brain. You are the thing that has the brain. You are not your brain. Now look, even if you were the world's foremost brain expert and you knew what was happening with every electron in someone's brain at a specific particular moment, you still wouldn't have a clue about what's going on inside that person's mind. Surgeons can have access to my brain, but only I have access to my mind. This is what makes you human and not a machine. Psychology, the study of the mind, is not reducible to physics and biology and chemistry. Yet, there are many materialists, people who believe that physical matter is all that exists, that the only reality, including every thought, every feeling, every mind, every will, all of this, is totally explained in terms of matter in motion, simply physical phenomena. These materialists believe that we're no more than robots and that free will is an illusion, a myth. Now, why do they believe this? Because they understand that the moment they acknowledge that free will exists, that there really is an immaterial you beyond the physical realm, that there really is a mind, not just a brain, then there has to be something non-physical that accounts for our non-physical minds. Now, when you exercise your free will and you choose to think about all of this, hmm. you're going to probably reason, just like I did, that there's a great mind that accounts for the origin of your mind. But again, that's your choice. It's evidence of your free will. Are you more valuable than a dog or a cat or, for that matter, a tree? One of the biggest differences between Judeo-Christian values and secular values concerns this very issue, the worth of the human being. According to the Judeo-Christian value system, human beings are infinitely valuable. 
On the other hand, secular humanism devalues the worth of humans. As ironic as it may sound, the God-based Judeo-Christian value system renders humans infinitely more valuable than any humanistic value system. The reason is simple. If there is no God, human beings are only material beings, and therefore not worth anything beyond the matter of which they are composed. But in the Judeo-Christian system, human beings are created in the image of God, meaning that human life is sacred. In other words, we are either created in the image of carbon atoms, and therefore not worth much more than carbon, or we are created in the image of God, and therefore infinitely valuable. Our secular post-Judeo-Christian society has rendered human beings less significant than at any time in Western history. First, the secular denial that human beings are created in God's image has led to humans increasingly being equated with animals. That's why, over the course of 30 years of asking high school and college students if they would first try to save their dog or a stranger, two-thirds have always voted against the person. They either don't know what they would do, or they actually vote for the dog. And many adults now vote similarly. Why? There are two reasons. One is that, with the denial of the authority of higher values, such as religious teachings, people increasingly make moral decisions on the basis of how they feel. And since just about everybody feels more for their dog than for a stranger, many people simply choose the dog. The other reason is that once you get rid of Judeo-Christian values, there's no reason for elevating human worth over that of an animal. That's why people estranged from Judeo-Christian values, including many Jews and Christians, support programs such as Holocaust on Your Plate. Holocaust on Your Plate is a campaign developed by the animal rights group People for the Ethical Treatment of Animals, PETA, that teaches that there is no difference between the barbecuing of chickens in America and the burning of Jews in the Holocaust. Why? Because a human and a chicken are of equal worth. So too, in a notorious Tucson, Arizona case, a woman screamed to firefighters that her three babies were in the burning house. Thinking that the woman's children were trapped inside, the firefighters risked their lives to save the woman's three cats. If you think these two examples are either just theoretical, the dog stranger question, or extreme, the Tucson mother of cats, here's an issue that is neither theoretical nor extreme. More and more people believe, as PETA does, that even if it would lead to a cure for cancer or AIDS, it would be wrong to experiment on animals. In fact, many animal rights advocates believe that even to save a human life, it would be wrong to kill a pig to obtain a heart valve. The 20th century showed vividly what happens to human worth when Judeo-Christian values are abandoned. Nazi Germany and the various communist regimes all rejected Judeo-Christian values and ended up slaughtering the largest number of people in human history. For Nazism, Jews and members of other non-Aryan groups were declared worthless and murdered in the millions. For communists, human worth was determined solely by communist parties which murdered tens of millions of people. Only by rejecting Judeo-Christian values could Nazis declare Jews, Slavs, and others subhuman. And only by rejecting Judeo-Christian values could communist regimes slaughter those they called class enemies. Individual human life meant nothing. Meanwhile, human slavery was abolished only in the Judeo-Christian world. And of course, for nearly all those who reject Judeo-Christian values, the human fetus is worthless, if its mother deems it so. Finally, there is an increasingly vocal part of the environmentalist movement that also denigrates human worth. For these individuals, the human being is not infinitely precious. Trees and rivers 
and mountains are. So, are you more valuable than a dog or a cat or a tree? That depends on your value system. No document in world history so changed the world for the better, as did the Ten Commandments. Western civilization, the civilization that developed universal human rights, created women's equality, ended slavery, created parliamentary democracy, among other unique achievements, would not have developed without them. As you will see when each of the Ten Commandments is explained, these commandments are as relevant today as when they were given over 3,000 years ago. In fact, they're so relevant that the Ten Commandments are all that is necessary to make a good world a world free of tyranny and cruelty. Imagine for a moment a world in which there was no murder or theft. In such a world, there would be no need for armies or police or weapons. Men and women and children could walk anywhere at any time of day or night without any fear of being killed or robbed. Imagine further a world in which no one coveted what belonged to their neighbor, a world in which children honored their mother and father and the family unit thrived. A world in which people obeyed the injunction not to lie. The recipe for a good world is all there in these ten sublime commandments. But there is a catch. The Ten Commandments are predicated on the belief that they were given by an authority higher than any man, any king, or any government. That's why the sentence preceding the Ten Commandments asserts the following. God spoke all these words. You see, if the Ten Commandments, as great as they are, were given by any human authority, then any person could say, who is this man Moses? Who is this king or queen? Who is this government to tell me how I should behave? Okay, so why is God indispensable to the Ten Commandments? Because, to put it as directly as possible, if it isn't God who declares murder wrong, murder isn't wrong. Yes, this strikes many people today as incomprehensible, even absurd. Many of you are thinking, is this guy saying you can't be a good person if you don't believe in God? Let me respond as clearly as possible. I am not saying that. Of course there are good people who don't believe in God, just as there are bad people who do. And many of you are also thinking, I believe murder is wrong, I don't need God to tell me. Now that response is only half true. I have no doubt that if you're an atheist, and you say that you believe murder is wrong, you believe murder is wrong. But forgive me, you do need God to tell you. We all need God to tell us. You see, even if you figured out murder is wrong on your own, without God and the Ten Commandments, how do you know it's wrong? Not believe it's wrong, I mean know it's wrong. The fact is, you can't. Because without God, right and wrong are just personal beliefs, personal opinions. I think shoplifting is okay, you don't. Unless there is a God, all morality is just opinion and belief. And virtually every atheist philosopher has acknowledged this. Another problem with the view that you don't need God to believe that murder is wrong is, a lot of people haven't shared your view. And you don't have to go back very far in history to prove this. In the 20th century, millions of people in communist societies and under Nazism killed about 100 million people. And that doesn't count a single soldier killed in war. So don't get too confident about people's ability to figure out right from wrong without a higher authority. It's all too easy to be swayed by a government or a demagogue or an ideology or to rationalize that the wrong you're doing isn't really wrong. And even if you do figure out what is right and wrong, God is still necessary. People who know the difference between right and wrong do the wrong thing all the time. You know why? Because they can. They can because they think no one is watching. 
But if you recognize that God is the source of moral law, you believe that he is always watching. So even if you're an atheist, you would want people to live by the moral laws of the Ten Commandments. And even an atheist has to admit that the more people who believe God gave them, and therefore they are not just opinion, the better the world would be. What is the first of the Ten Commandments? It might seem like an odd question, but it's not. Jews and Christians give different answers. The reason is that what we know as the Ten Commandments is, in the original Hebrew, the Ten Statements. And since the Hebrew is the original, we begin with the first statement, which all religions agree is, I am the Lord your God, who took you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. This statement is so important that none of the other commandments make sense without it. First, it asserts that God is giving these commandments, not Moses and not any other human being. Second, God is the one who delivered you from slavery. Again, no human being did this, not even Moses. Therefore, you have an obligation to me, God. And what is that obligation? That you live by the following nine commandments. This is the beginning of what is known as ethical monotheism, the greatest world-changing innovation of the Hebrew Bible. It means two things. Ethical monotheism means that the one God, that's monotheism, is the source of ethics, of morality. Morality, an objective code of right and wrong, does not emanate from human opinion. It emanates from God and therefore transcends human opinion. The other meaning of ethical monotheism is that what God most wants from us is that we treat other human beings morally. None of the Ten Commandments concern what humans must do, quote unquote, for God. Pre-Ten Commandments religions all believe that people must do a lot for their gods. For example, feed them and even sacrifice people to them. But now, thanks to the Ten Commandments, mankind learned that what God wants is that we be good to our fellow human beings. Even the commandments concerning not having false gods and not carrying God's name in vain are ultimately about morality. The thing we can do for God is to treat all his other children decently. Every parent can relate to this. Parents, or at least healthy parents, have indescribable joy when they see their children act lovingly toward one another and indescribable pain when they see their children hurt one another. So to God, who is likened to our Father in Heaven, cares most about how we treat other human beings, all of whom are his children. The third critical teaching of the first statement, I am the Lord your God who took you out of Egypt, out of the house of bondage, is the importance and the meaning of freedom. Note that God is not saying in this introduction to the Ten Commandments that he created the world. It surely would have made a lot of sense for God to introduce the Ten Commandments with the statement, I am the Lord your God who created the world. That is, after all, pretty impressive and would make sense. I created the world, you better listen to me. But no. The one thing God declares is that he took the children of Israel out of slavery and into freedom. That's how much God hates slavery and how important God considers freedom. The founders of America base their entire view of America on this belief that God wants us to be free. That is why the most iconic symbol of the American Revolution the Liberty Bell has only one sentence inscribed on it, a verse from the Hebrew Bible, proclaim liberty throughout all the land unto all the inhabitants thereof. But there is one other equally important lesson about freedom imparted by the opening statement of the Ten Commandments. What freedom means. The giver of the Ten Commandments is in effect saying, I took you out of slavery and into freedom. And these Ten Commandments? are the way to make a free society. You cannot be a free people if you do whatever you want. Freedom comes from moral self-control. There is no other way to achieve it. 
And fourth and finally, by telling us that he liberated the Hebrew slaves, God made clear that he cares deeply about human beings. It is impressive to create the world, but what most matters is not only that there is a creator, but that the creator cares about his creation. All of that is in the one statement with which the Ten Commandments begins. Let's discuss the second commandment according to the oldest, that is the Jewish enumeration of the Ten Commandments. In Christian tradition, it's the first commandment. The most common translation begins, you shall have no other gods before me. The commandment then goes on to prohibit both making idols and worshiping idols. Most people, when they think of this commandment, understandably think that it only prohibits the worship of idols and the worship of gods, such as the ancient pagan gods of rain, of fertility, all the other nature gods, and chief gods, such as the Roman Jupiter and the Greek Zeus. However, there is a major problem with this understanding of the commandment. Since no one today worships these gods, let alone worships idols made of stone, most people think that this commandment is irrelevant to modern life. The irony, however, is that this commandment is not only relevant to modern life, it is in many ways the mother of all the other commandments. Why is it so relevant today? Because today we have as many false gods as the ancients did. And why is it the mother of all the other commandments? Because if we identify false gods and avoid worshiping them, we will eliminate one of the greatest barriers to a good world, false gods. So let's begin by defining a false god. The point of biblical monotheism is that there is only one God and that only this God, the creator of the universe, who demands that we keep these Ten Commandments, is to be worshipped. Why? First, because one God means one human race. Only if we all have the same creator or father, as it were, are we all brothers and sisters. Second, having the same parent also means that no person or group is intrinsically more valuable than any other. And third, one God means one moral standard for all people. If God declares murder wrong, it is wrong for everyone, and you can't go to another God for another moral standard. When anything else is worshipped, bad things result. Not only things that can obviously lead to evil, such as the worship of power, or race, or money, or flag, but also things that are almost always seen as quite beautiful, such as art, or education, or even love. Yes, any of these often wonderful things, when worshipped, can lead to terrible results. Take art. Many of the cruelest humans in history loved beautiful music and art. But as a music lover, I learned early in life the sad fact that great music can be used to inspire people to follow evil just as much as it can be used to inspire people to do good. The great Hollywood director Stanley Kubrick vividly made this point in his classic 1971 film, A Clockwork Orange. In it, men rape and murder while classical music plays in the background. Take education. We all recognize how important education can be, from preparing people to be able to find work, to understanding the world. But education in and of itself, divorced from the higher ends of God and goodness, can lead, and often has led, to great evil. Many of the best educated people in Germany supported Hitler and the Nazis, and almost all of the Western world supporters of the genocidal regimes of Stalin in the Soviet Union and Mao in China were highly educated. There is nothing about a PhD that guarantees a person will be wiser, kinder, or more ethical than someone with only a high school education. The same holds true even of love. Love, of course, is so often beautiful. But it too can lead to evil. In the 20th century, people who put love of country above love of God and goodness often committed terrible evil. And here's a test for you. 
Imagine that the pet you love and a stranger, a person you don't know and therefore could not possibly love, are drowning. Do you first try to save your pet or the stranger? Well, if love is an end in itself, you save your pet. But if you hold human life as a higher value than love, you won't follow love. This commandment made the ethical revolution of the Bible and of the Ten Commandments, what is known as ethical monotheism, possible. Worship the God of the Ten Commandments, and you will make a good world. Worship a false god, no matter how noble-sounding, and you will end up with a world of cruelty. I'm Dennis Prager. Join Prager University, subscribe to our YouTube channel, and sign up for free at PragerU.com.